Hi, I'm Jerry Gordon, Senior Editor of the New English Review, and we're here with a periodic guest and expert in security and technology by the name of Dr. Stephen Bryan. By background, he was a former Undersecretary for uh, Security and Technology during the Reagan era at the Pentagon. Uh, he also was, prior to that, a staffer on the Hill, I think, in foreign relations. And subsequently, he became an executive of an international defense company. And we knew him as the go-to person when we had to deal with things like uh, not only military technology, but the strategies and the geopolitics that go with it. So welcome, Steve. Uh, Steve, this has been a pretty active period, and it's a period of concern primarily about the rise of the China threat, so to speak. And the first evidence of that was a panic attack in the Pentagon by General Milley, who called the revelation about a Chinese launch of a hypersonic glide vehicle from a satellite. He called it so-called Sputnik moment. Um, so how troubling is the existence of that Chinese threat to both US satellite and also missile defense? Well, let's start with Mr. General Milley, to be fair, <laughs> since uh, the, the thing was launched in August and he doesn't talk about it till the end of October. Uh, huh? How come? They covered it up. That's how come. They didn't want us to know about it. And that's more disturbing even than what the Chinese did, that they're withholding information because they didn't just discover it in October. You know, anything that goes up in, in orbit is tracked, period. And they didn't feel well what was going on. Um, so I was, I was as much disturbed by that as by what the Chinese did, which is troubling. Uh, they launched a fraction, what's called a fractional orbit bombardment system or FOBs um, and released from it a, a, a glider, a hypersonic glider uh, against a mock target, which it missed by about 20 miles, 25 miles. No one's quite sure how much it missed, but it certainly missed by a lot. Um, uh, and so it's, it's still uh, in the category of uh, uh, want to have, Chinese want to have a hypersonic glide vehicle that works, but they don't have it yet. They have one that partly works. Um, now, the, the importance of this is, of course, that if you can have nuclear weapons circling around the Earth, um, there's very little warning time for the United States or anybody else, for that matter, that might be hit by a nuclear weapon because Instead of traveling 8,000 miles, it probably has to travel less than 1,000 miles. So the time involves very short. And then you're dealing with a hypersonic vehicle, which is extremely fast. A glider probably makes Mach 8 to Mach 10, which is you know 10 times the speed of sound. Uh, that's awfully fast. That's 7,000 plus miles an hour. Um, it's a, it means you have very little time to react. And one of the great major concerns uh, used to be a concern we had about the Soviet Union later on the Russia but mostly the Soviet Union was the risk of a breakout to a first strike capability mm -hmm. now a first strike capability means the ability to destroy your adversary before he can do anything about it that's the idea we have in the United States nuclear posture is retaliatory that is to say, if we are in a, in a encounter a, a nuclear threat where a missile is incoming, we launch. We launch. Uh, with the first strike, you can think about launching, but you're not going to have a chance to do it. It doesn't. You can't instantly launch a rocket. You have to, you know, get it ready. It, it takes some time, some minutes maybe 10 minutes, maybe five minutes, but it certainly takes some time. You're gonna have a minute at the most. And first of all, you have to recognize what this thing is. And hypersonic glide vehicles are very hard to detect. Uh, they produce what's called a plasma in front of the, the, the 
the the vehicle, the, the hypersonic vehicle, which which hides its radar signature, it confuses the radar. So uh, it, it is a very troubling thing, and you know the U.S. Is, has been opposed to militarizing space, and certainly about having any weapons in space. In 1967, uh, China, as well as Russia and ourselves and other countries signed what, the Outer Space Treaty, which says you're not to militarize space with weapons. So immediately, uh, China has violated that. And there you have it. Now, do they care? Probably not. Uh, they don't care much about anything. But, but you know, the, the next time that they claim that they're acting within international law, you can think about something else because it's not true. They don't do that. They, they act on their national interests, whatever they think their national interest is. And, and so they are now threatening the United States. So Milley was right. Sputnik was the wrong analogy because Sputnik was not a weapon. It was a satellite. And that's all it was. And eventually we launched, after a couple of Vanguard crashed and, you know, crashed and blew up, we launched a Redstone rocket with a with a satellite on the end. It worked thanks, thanks to the former Nazi named Werner von Braun. Um, but it worked, and so we were in the space race. But these were these were competitions, not with weapons, but with satellites. So I think it's worse than a Sputnik moment. I think it's a very disturbing sign of China's intentions, politically and strategically, that the United States really refuses to acknowledge. And that's scary, because we're not preparing properly to deal with those kinds of challenges and certainly with those kinds of threats. And we don't have a policy to deal with it. None at all. Not a part of policy, half a policy, a smidgen of policy. We have no policy. I mean, we're at policy free, as they say. And, and, and therefore, we're not responding correctly. And we're not taking the actions that we should be taking. But that's, that's my opinion about it. We've uh, almost rules of the comment from uh, General Milley King, an Air Force announcement that, uh, gee, we've done something like nine tests of a hyperglide vehicle as well. The question is, um, well, a glider so doesn't have to be an outer, you know, has doesn't have to be a fractional orbit orbiting system. It just has to be something released from a rocket or an aircraft. Right. Um, you know, it has to be powered with something to start it off, to gain enough momentum so that it can glide from there. So is that constituted deterrent, or is that just simply a development on the part of us? A deterrent? No, it's not a deterrent. What, what's a deterring? I mean, it's not a deterrent. Let's talk about deterrence. It's a very important concept, of course. And, and the, the U.S position has been, we don't need air defenses, really. We don't really need to do much of anything except have a very strong nuclear triad. And the nuclear triad consists of the air, uh, bombers, for example, with nuclear weapons, uh, ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and, and MRBMs, but mostly ICBMs. And missiles fired from submarines, from the Trident-style submarine. That's the triad. Uh, now that's fine, uh, provided that the other guy doesn't have much more than that. So that you have a kind of balance, and they call that, that doctrine mutually assured destruction. Now, I am not a proponent of mutually assured destruction or what's sometimes called the MAD doctrine, M-A-D, mutually assured destruction. I think it's, it's a false premise for many reasons, but one of them is that, that the other guy is always gonna be trying to get a, you know, a leg up and to be able to challenge you with a first strike capability. And that's what the Soviets were doing, working very hard at it. Uh, and that's why the treaties, the SALT treaties and the START treaties and the INF treaties and all these things were so difficult to negotiate because, uh, first of all, they were very hard to, ver to, to authenticate, to verify. Did the Russians really have X or did they have Y? You know, were they doing this or were they not doing that? On and on. 
The Russians pay attention to it, you know, occasionally. You know, they'll do some things and some things they won't do. It depends on their national interest. The Chinese have no arms agreements with anybody. So they simply do what they want when they want to. So there, there we are. I mean, one of the consequences of, of a mutually assured destruction approach is that the United States has no credible air defenses against space launched weapons, for that matter, against airplanes. We don't have anything. Talking about the triad, um, Chinese have grown a significant blue water Navy, an estimated 335 vessels. Yeah, it's bigger than ours. Right. And uh, what have we done? And, and let me take, a, take you back to a friend of yours, Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman. He's the guy who built, as I recall, and well, he was aiming for a 600 ship Navy. Maybe. Never got there. Yeah. So the question is what do we really have in the way of operating fleets in several different regions at this point in time? And how do we confront the Chinese? Well, let's start it. I mean, I think overall, not counting a few pieces that we really are terrible waste of money and shouldn't have, like the littoral combat ship. But overall, uh, the US Navy is strong. It has good ships. It has aircraft carriers that are the, world, the world's best and biggest. Uh, it has nuclear submarines that are absolutely first class, the best in the world. So I think that's the positive side. The, the negative side is these ships are getting old. Some of them are 20 years old. We are up, updating them and we're you know, trying to do that. Um, but there's only so much you can do with a ship that you can paint on radar from 500 miles away. You know, it, it's just, there are certain limitations. Um, but I think on the whole, the, the US Navy is quite strong. The, the problem is the, the, the usual problem of the United States is stretched between Europe, the Middle East, and, and on into, on into um, if you want, on into the Pacific region, the whole Pacific region, but from well, the South Pacific to the northern, the northern parts. We're very stretched. Um, and, you know, our, our adversaries understand that. So they think they can dominate us in one sector. And that's especially the Chinese. The Russians, not so much, because the, that's not the Russian game, but, but it's the Chinese game. Plus, uh, beyond that, the China, China wants to be uh, the world's superpower, the leading. They want to replace the United States as the world's superpower. So in order to do that, they have to be able to have a huge navy, a huge air force, a huge missile force, a huge army, all those things with the most modern equipment. And that's what they're striving for. Uh, in the shorter or in the more tactical areas, uh, we are a bit weak in certain places. And we're, we're weak in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, we have, a, of course, the famous deployment in Japan, which is very important to us, but it's, it needs more ships. Um, we, we only have one aircraft carrier out there, and sometimes we don't have any because we de redeploy it, as we did with Afghanistan. Um, we're thin. So, you know, there's a very good case to say that the Navy is, the Navy needs to be bucked up in certain categories. One of them are missile boats or missile destroyers, which uh, the Biden administration was supposed to buy two of those. They cut it in half. So we're only buying one new one, which is unfortunate. I think very unfortunate. Um, and I'm worried about cuts to the carrier the carriers, you know, because there are proponents in the administration that want to reduce the 10 or 11 carriers. 10 or 11 sounds great, except four or five of them always being repaired. So you really have five, five at most out there. Uh, we really could use a few more. Um, uh, I know now they're like, well, the, missiles, the Chinese missiles are going to destroy them. They're not going to survive, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, I right, figure out how to kill the Chinese missiles, you know. That's, their, that's the mandate. 
go do it. Don't complain or cry, or don't say you're going to get rid of the carriers. You'll, you know, the U.S. will have no ability to project power. But go fix the problem. And you know, we the Chinese have had the DF twenty one D now for five years, six years. Um, what's the answer to it? Come on, guys. There is an answer, by the way, but they're not pursuing it very strongly. Um, and it's incomprehensible to me. Instead, they're building LCS, which is worthless. Well, talking about uh, submarines, uh, we're first going to deal with the question of an, a suspicion on the part of some intelligence analysts that China has the capability of launching continental, intercontinental ballistic missiles essentially from their subs and their waters hitting the United States. I think that's probably more speculation than anything else. I don't think it's a sound thought. The, it, it's, it's very difficult. That's a long distance. You know, how, how, how many thousands of miles is it? Miles. 8,000 miles, something like that? I, I don't think so. I don't think they could do that. And um, I don't know why they'd want to. Uh, you know, if you want to threaten someplace, sail your submarines across the Pacific, then launch. Or sail them off to the Atlantic and launch, if that's what you want to do. But uh, I, I don't understand where that assessment came from, and I don't believe it. Talking along the lines of submarines, we noticed that our uh, president, Mr. Biden, at the G20 meetings had a sidebar with Mr. Macron in France. And he, uh, quote, uh, did a mea culpa. He apologized for the clumsy, clumsy handling of the whole activity. Right. Um, but then there was a, uh, I call it a, a floated rumor that somehow or other the U.S. was going to buck up its allies down under by selling them, quote, nuclear subs to replace the diesel subs that the French were going to uh, provide them under the contract. Well, that's, what, that's what's supposed to happen between the U.S. and the U.K. are supposed right. to get together and, you know, this is all, it's still smoky, you know, hard to, hard to see through the fog. I mean, somehow we're going to design a, nuclear uh, submarine, but which type? An attack submarine, a ballistic missile submarine? There are very different kinds. Because a ballistic missile submarine also needs missiles. And Australians don't have any. Uh, or are we gonna give them an attack submarine? Well, that's good. You can, you can use those. That's what Collins class, the current uh, the submarines, and not nuclear, the diesel electric submarines that the Australians have uh, mm -hmm. is an, essentially an attack submarine. Um, carries torpedoes, you know, can lay mines too. Um, I'm not clear why the Australians need this. I mean, what, what do they gain by having a nuclear submarine? Um, not a whole lot, so because today, even though Pacific is a very big area, so range is very important. I don't think the Australians are gonna fight the Chinese uh, near Taiwan, it's too far away. I mean, I just don't see that. I don't think that's the area we want them to be active in. You know, strategically, we want them to patrol the South China Sea and in that region, because that would relieve us of that responsibility if they could do it well. And that makes a lot of sense from an alliance point of view, even though we have not and we are not in an alliance with Australia, and we don't even have a defense treaty with Australia, which most people don't realize. Um, but assuming that because Australia has been a very loyal ally and have pitched in, in in places like Afghanistan and Iraq and other places where, frankly, uh, it's not even clear why they did it. I mean, I guess they want to be a good friend, but it's uh, and they want to stay linked to the United States and the UK. You know, there's important to them. Um, so, I mean, you could do this with a, with a diesel electric submarine with a hydrogen power pack, which, uh, would, which would make it uh, more than acceptable from a range and operations point of view. It could stay underwater for months. You don't need nuclear. But, you know, we made a commitment to provide nuclear power plant, nuclear submarine design. And now the Australians probably going to have to figure out how to pay for it. 
because I haven't got the bill yet. <laughs> that may that may change. I have a feeling that at some point the Australians are going to say this is way too expensive, and, and then they can go talk to the Japanese and buy a very good submarine from the Japanese that's running on lithium. The first submarine in the world that runs on lithium batteries um, when it's not using its diesel power plant, and it has a hydrogen power pack, so it has it was called uh, AIP. Uh, and uh, so that's a wonderful submarine. Japanese are building them now. They can, the Australians can build them under license. Far better than the US and the UK trying to build a nuclear submarine for, for Australia, which anyway, the Chinese will steal the designs. The Australians follow the example of what Israel has done, speaking about AIP submarines. Which, uh, well, I don't know if Israel are the Israeli submarines AIP. They are. Are they? Well, they buy them from Germany. They did. Yeah, and and Thyssen in Germany makes these uh, modules, these uh, these uh, uh, hydrogen modules, which you can put into a submarine. Uh, they don't make the submarine, but they make the module. Um, good. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, but of course, Israel's range is problem is much less than Australia's or, or certainly the United States. It's a different game. I, well, I, might, yeah. I might add, they may be nuclear capable weapon wise. They are. Right. I said may. I, mean, I don't think it's ever been confirmed. Because if you ask the Israelis, they don't have any nuclear weapons. Oh, I wonder what those, uh, Popeye yeah. turbo uh, things are. Well, said. there's a famous story back from years ago when uh, John Glenn and Howard Baker, both were then senators, went to Israel and uh, went to see the prime minister, who was then Golda Meir. And, and they said, to, you know, uh, she said to them, uh, gentlemen, what can I do for you? I said, well, Madam Prime Minister, we would like to visit Demona. And she said, that's not Demona being the nuclear uh reactors location in in the negev desert and and uh, she said well that's not possible you can't do that well we're worried about nuclear proliferation madam prime minister and this would if we went there we could confirm whether there was was or wasn't and if there isn't then you know everything's great she says i'm sorry i can't do that but uh, i appreciate your asking and they left and she turned to an aide and said and even if we had nuclear weapons, would I tell them? <laughs> uh, that's a true story. <laughs> In any case, um, yeah. Uh, the Israelis have never confirmed they have any nuclear weapons of any kind. Right. You mentioned the Japanese uh, being a uh, pretty interesting constructor of uh, subs. And that raises the whole question about how decent is this so-called combined force of the US, Japanese, the Indians, and the Australians in terms of contending with the Chinese threat? Well, they are doing some exercises. Uh, there have been a couple of them in, in the last few months, which is very good. I think that's a good step. Uh, the real thing is to coordinate command and control capabilities. and. Uh, and that should also include Taiwan because they have something of a navy, not much. But they have a little navy. Um, but you know, all these things have to work together somehow. And it can't just be navy. It has to be air force. And there, Taiwan has a big air force. Um, and so does Japan, fairly big air force. And Australians less so. Um, and India is building a pretty decent air force, has a, has a fairly good navy. Um, and is working on a couple of aircraft carriers. So, yeah, I mean, there is there is the, it's a good thing to coordinate and uh, to carry out exercises. And then the more that we can develop a, a command and control system uh, and, and, and organize it properly, the more we could, uh, I think, confront China's uh, power grabs. Speaking about Taiwan, uh, we had the Emperor of the East, otherwise known as Xi Jinping, um, 
come out and say, if uh, anybody stands up in defense of uh, Taiwan, they're going to be prosecuted. <laughs> that, that could be a lame threat or it could be realistic. Well, he's, he's, threatening, he's threatening the Taiwanese. So right. what he's saying is that the, the people that we're going to execute are all those who are pro-independence in Taiwan, which is two thirds of the island. <laughs> and everybody else is fine. Um, uh, I thought that was an idiotic and stupid thing for him to say, and 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 really uh, tells you just how nasty and awful these people are. Uh, it, it goes outside of any uh, understanding of what international relations is supposed to be about, and what diplomatic relations are about, and 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 human rights is about. So the whole thing is disgusting. And that brings up the question of the so-called porcupine defense strategy that uh, allegedly the Biden administration has bought into. Uh, we've had reports of uh, US trainers over there for which the Chinese uh, are extremely upset about. But there was also an assessment that appeared in the Wall Street Journal of all places saying that the morale of the what we would consider as the Taiwanese National Guard is pretty low. Always has been. That's nothing new. I think. Uh, yeah, no. It's, it's, it's a problem because uh, they're underpaid and there's so many jobs available for people with talent that if most, most people in Taiwan, because they have a volunteer force now, most people in Taiwan want to work in the private sector. They want to work for the government and they don't want to work for the military. So it is a bit, and, and, and there's another, there's an old, uh, an older problem, which is that the, the military in Taiwan was uh, dominated by the old Kuomintang, the party of Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and their methods and their approach to military discipline and military organization and, and everything, this military society in general, is not what we would consider modern. Can I say it nicely? It's not modern. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the bottom line is that the Taiwanese have their hands full trying to, to improve their military. And, and, and I don't know if they're doing it or not. I hope they are, but I can't prove it. I, I think that of the three forces, the strongest is the Air Force. Uh, has the highest level of pride, uh, gets to fly you know, neat airplanes, uh, uh, it, it knows it has a national mission. Uh, next is the Navy, but the Navy is very small and, uh, and the equipment is, is not very good. And then finally, the land forces, which I think is where the problems are. Turning to the Middle East, we had an interesting episode last week that followed the Iraqi election. We had a drone strike against the residents, I gather, of the newly elected prime minister. That's right. The, the suspicions are that it may have been launched by one of the Shia proxy militias, but ultimately the uh, hidden hand, so to speak, of the Iranians are involved with doing Well, this. they run some of these militias. And yeah. the, probable, the probable perpetrator is Asaib al-Haq, um, which is a Shiite militia run by the Iranians. And its leader is a, is a guy who's spent time in jail, uh, named, but he's out, and of course he runs this thing, Qais Kazali. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that was an Iranian operation. Now, the, they were fairly clever because the, the um, um, drones were Chinese drones, commercial drones that had been modified. And the, the explosion, explosive part was a, looks like to me, a, an 81 millimeter mortar shell that had been changed over to a bomb with a contact fuse, that's what it was. And there were three of them, they claimed two were shot down, I don't believe that. I think two crashed and didn't, one didn't explode because they have pictures of the, of the 81 millimeter mortar shell. 
uh, it didn't go off. Uh, probably didn't release correctly. And uh, and the other one crashed into the, the looks like a townhouse actually. Um, and the uh, it's an interesting picture. It hit on the upper floors, hit the roof and the upper floors. Um, down below, it blew out the front door, but it was a steel security door, so it didn't break. And it blew out one of the window panes, which also was a bulletproof window pane, so it didn't break. Um, but basically, uh, the prime minister was lucky. Could have been killed, which is what their intent was. Correct. East of Iraq is, of course, Saudi Arabia. And there's a couple of issues there. One is- and Just two, is that all? That's pretty good. <laughs> one of them popped up today was uh, the question of uh, increasing relationships with China. Um, and the other more directly is whether or not the so-called uh, UAE Saudi coalition is going to be able to defend the principal capital left in, uh, or bastion as we call it, in Yemen, a place called Merit. Yeah, so I don't know whether they can do that or not. I mean, that's it's still a, an open question. Yeah. Um, they're trying, of course, and they've been successful, at least to the point of, of the Houthis looked like they were going to really take over that whole uh, western side of the country and the ports on the in the Straits of Baba Mandeb and all that in the Red Sea, and, and uh, they didn't succeed. So that, that's fairly interesting. Um, the U.S. is putting a lot of pressure on the Saudis, especially the Saudis. The UAE is kind of out of it, but the Saudis are being pressured heavily by Washington. And I think that's wrong, absolutely wrong. There's not going to be a political settlement. It's an Iranian operation. You can't negotiate with the Houthis, you have to negotiate, negotiate with Tehran. And Washington damn well knows that, but they don't want to admit it. They just want to screw the Saudis, in my opinion. I think it's very unfortunate, very foolish. Now, as far as, uh, well, does that answer your question or did I leave out something? No, you answered it. You did. Okay. So I was oh, no, you mentioned the Chinese. We should talk a minute about that. Um, uh, the Saudis have bought things from China before. This is, this is not new. They have intermediate range ballistic missiles that they bought from China in the 80s. So buying from China is something that they're, you know, they have done before. They also would like to buy from Russia. Whether the Russians will sell them and, and what they want and whether it will be, you know, whether it will be any good is, you know, some open questions because they also the Russians support the Iranians. So it's it's they're they're in a, a very difficult position, I think, because the United States is is not really helping them. I mean, that's a nice way to put it. Question is: Is the United States also helping Israel in preparations for what is supposed to happen this month? meaning in November, with the renewal of the EU3 US negotiations with Iran about another version of JCOP. Well, I mean, the administration has been perfectly clear with the Israelis and everybody else that they want to negotiate with the Iranians and they want to deal on the joint, uh, the joint agreement, whatever you want to call it. It's not really an agreement because the Iranians never signed it. But, <laughs> um, but it's an agreement by, by the Western countries to uh, deal with Iran in a certain way. And they've laid down certain principles, which the Iranians allegedly follow, but of course we know they don't. Uh, they do what they want, as any other country. I mean, look, when it comes to nuclear weapons, countries do what they want. Anyone that believes that you can stop a country from building a nuclear weapon if they want to build one is crazy. They'll never do that. Is they're talking about their their national uh, security in, in big letters, so they're never going to do that. Um, the instance of that uh, was uh, with the late Mr. Gaddafi in Libya, as I recall. 
who in his reaction to uh, the U.S. bombing Saddam Hussein basically uh, decided it was time to get rid of his stuff. Well, and he wasn't going anywhere with it. I mean, he was he was kidding himself, I think, and he knew it. Uh, he was trying desperately to buy a nuclear weapon you know, on the black market, you know, from Pakistan, from from the Russians, from anybody that would sell him a nuclear weapon, he would be very happy to have one. Uh, he didn't ever get one. So anyway, and no delivery system. So the, the whole thing was a charade, him, I think. Um, he, looked, he was a little crazy, don't you think? Uh, I think that's a kind way to put it. Anybody that goes sits in a tent in Rome, when there are perfectly nice places to stay in good restaurants, is, is clearly, you know, uh, adult minded Well, he, he's gone. Let's put it that way. Well, he was murdered, yes. Um, thinking about that, going back to Israel's dilemma, um, it is consciously engaging in another war between the wars, but directly against Iranians in Syria. It's like every other day there's an announcement about a raid against Iranian units. Yeah, because the Iranians keep trying to bring in drones and cruise missiles and other weapons uh, to threaten Israel. So the Israelis are trying to put out fires, but that's not where the fire started. Yes, on all of its borders, I might add. Um, uh, yeah, well, not all. I mean, they don't have any real threat from the West Bank these days. I mean, any any military threat. Um, they have a threat in, in, in Gaza and they have a threat in the north from Hezbollah and the Iranians. And they're the same thing. I mean, Hezbollah is a creature of the Iranians. Last week, I had uh, the pleasure of watching some of your colleagues at the Center for Security Policy uh, engage in opining on how far the Iranian nuclear capability has gotten at this point in time. Right. And there were certain takeaways from that stuff that were kind of stunning. At the mm -hmm. top of the list, I think, was David Albright from what I call the good ISIS in Washington, D.C., who should know better as, a, as an ex-nuke uh, weapons inspector, essentially, you know, right. what happened. But there were others on that conversation, including David Wormser um, and Fred Flights, to a degree, and another individual. But what were the, some of the takeaways in that discussion? Well, I think the, the conclusion, as I understand it, was that, that the Iranians are maybe a month away from having a, a nuclear weapon if they want to have one, right. and maybe six months away from being able to deploy it. Now. Do you believe that? I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think the, 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 the Israelis probably have pretty good intelligence. Um, but there's even a dispute in Israel between the former Mossad guy who says, eh, this is all nonsense. They're further back than that. Two years away, three years, uh, you know, and some guys and, and others are saying, no, it's two, two weeks, <laughs> much closer. Um, the Iranians have to, I, I think the bottom line is the Iranians have to calculate what happens if they say they do have. And when should they say it? Uh, and they got to test it. So do they want to take, you know, it's one, th th that's part of it. The other part of it is one bomb doesn't make a, a nation. You need an arsenal. Okay. Be to be credible, you need an arsenal. Um, how many is that? In the, in the case of North Korea, it's about 20 weapons. For Iran, that's a bigger country. Maybe it's 40 weapons. I don't know. But I think they have to have enough of a, of a capability that uh, anyone that wants to try and liquidate it would have a real problem. Um, they're far away from that. They just don't have the resources for it right now. So there's a difference between having a nuclear weapon that you can test, having a deployable weapon, 
and finally having an arsenal of weapons. I would make those three distinctions. Having a weapon, they may even have one now, but they haven't tested it, at least as far as we know, unless they did it in North Korea, but they haven't been a test there for a long time either. So, so if they have a weapon, they have to test it. They haven't done that yet. And if they test it, do they want to test it when they have one or do they want to wait till they have 20 or 30? Uh, and then, of course, they need to show that they have a, a way of, of, of uh, firing it off, putting it on or, you know, miniaturizing it enough to fit it on one of those North Korean rockets that they have. So I think they have a lot of challenges. Now, the Israelis know all that, and they're also getting ready in case they do to take military action. I mean, that's clear, too. They've so, already which is one of the reasons why the Biden administration wants to deal with the Iranians, but nobody will believe the deal anyway. An interesting proposal that was floated in Congress this past week, saying that if the Biden administration goes in that direction, why not simply this time not invade an executive order, shall we say, but rather consider it as a treaty to be passed by Congress? That amounts to putting it into a lethal chamber. Well, I, th I think, in fact, it, it requires treaty consideration. I would agree with that. Yeah, which means two thirds of the Senate have to give their advice and consent. That's what the Constitution says. Executive agreements can't really cover something like this. This is this, you know. The, the Russians, look, the arms, use as a model, the arms agreements with the Russians, they have to be ratified. Mm -hmm. they, they, you, you don't get them otherwise. They don't mean anything. They, uh, and, and the next administration can change them. They're, they're not binding. So, so uh, no, it has to be a treaty, but they won't do that because they know it wouldn't pass. They wouldn't have a chance. Let's go a little bit north out of the Middle East and deal with the question of uh, what's going on in the border region between Russia and the Ukraine. A lot of borscht. They, like, they like borscht on both sides, you know, so. Is that correct? <laughs> with or without. The, the Ukrainians like the borscht with potatoes and the Russians don't use potatoes, but that's a different story. No, Russians eat sour cream. <laughs> Uh, that's a beet borscht, but the more popular borscht is a cabbage borscht. So there have been some proposals floated in Congress that we should send troops to the Ukraine. Yeah, I know. I think it's madness. I mean, the, the, first of all, we have, we have no real strategic interest in Ukraine, to be honest about it. I mean, yes, we, we would like Ukraine to remain an independent country. But the last thing we want to do is be caught up uh, dealing with their craziness. You know, they're not reliable. I mean, they do, you know, they provoke the Russians as much as the Russians provoke them. So let's be honest about it. Um, I, I really think it would be a terrible mistake to send troops there. And I'm not even sure we should be sending armaments there. I think we're just asking for trouble with the Russians we don't need. So not, not NATO country, should not be a NATO country. There's no justification for it. Interesting assessment. Well, I, you know, I, I, I know there's a, we used to say there's a Ukrainian mafia in the Pentagon, uh, which there was, uh, at least when I was there. And they're all good people and I, I like them a lot. But I, I think that we have to think about what our interests are. Do we need to fight a war in Ukraine? How are we going to do that? We're nowhere near the Ukraine. And then so, look, the Russians, if, the, if we really did that, what do you think the Russians will do? They'll slam the Balkans, or they'll slam the, the Poles. They'll do something to cause a huge amount of grief that nobody wants. Europeans don't want it, even though they talk out of both sides of their mouth. Uh, they, they don't want it. Uh, we don't need it. It doesn't do any good for the Ukrainians because it just gets a lot of them killed 
and it doesn't do any good for the Europeans for the same reason. So I don't see the benefit of it. I don't see why, how we gain anything. Russia is not an expanding power, despite what they did in Georgia, and despite what they did in the Crimea, and despite what they're doing in the, in the Donbass area. They're not really an expanding power. The, and you know, they, they lost their empire. I'm gonna give it back to them, well, why? Well, they appear to be uh, running up uh, against some of the former Soviet era states in the Caspian Sea, I notice these days. Um, Azerbaijan in particular and others in that same perimeter, Iran, I guess, sort of on the sideline, are uh, basically developing a naval force. Azerbaijan? Yes. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Uh, Azerbaijan is depending on the Russians. Right. And the Israelis and the Turks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, they won their war. So they should be happy. Be good, live long, as they say. Last month uh, was the 48th commemoration of the Yom Kippur War. Yeah. A lot of good guys were killed there, a lot of aircraft, and especially tanks were lost. Yes. Especially M60 tanks. Yes. I'm very, I'm very familiar with it because uh, I spend a lot of time in Israel with uh, uh, the tank uh, commanders and with uh, the tank builders and the tank the people who took uh, chieftain, uh, chieftain tanks, uh, not chieftain, sorry, Centurion tanks, uh, M48s, M60s, and had a few Russian tanks. And you know, tried to keep them alive during the war, and, and they they realized that that uh, they were deficient, and the M60 was the worst of the bunch. It's an American tank, of course. So was the oh. M48. Yeah, um, yeah. it was deficient both in power, firepower, and and crew protection, armor protection. It just didn't, you know, it couldn't stand up to the Russian Sager missiles. These are, you know, uh, anti-tank missiles. Um, and so something else was needed. And uh, Israel decided to build its own tank, the Merkava. Uh, that was a very important step. And it also developed its own anti-tank weapons that could kill the Egyptian tanks, which were Russian tanks and Syrian tanks. The, 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 one of the worst battles with tanks was actually in the Golan Heights. With the Syrian right. tanks. So uh, uh, General Tal, Israel Tal, Talik, he's called, uh, a kind of political leftist, but a brilliant tank general who greatly admired Rommel. Uh, I knew him quite well, and, and uh, I like to say he was my friend. He's not alive anymore. Uh, took me to the tank factory and showed me the Merkava when it's just pieces on the floor. Mm -hmm. and, and then explained all the theory behind it and, and why it would help uh, Israel. Because this was before the M1 Abrams tank was designed. In fact, uh, Tal was one of the uh, consultants on the Abrams tank. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, and and some of the technology of the that the Israelis developed to deal with problems that arose in the seventy three war with tanks, the uh, fuel tanks exploding, uh, was one of them. Uh, the gun gun barrels warping. Uh, the Israelis developed a thermal shroud for the gun barrel. They developed foaming of the fuel tanks to protect against explosions. Uh, they did a lot of things to to mitigate uh, the risk, but you still you, you still had the problem of the enemy's um, anti tank weapons and how to suppress that. But out of that came a remarkable weapon, the spike. Spike. Yeah, that, that really is a remarkable weapon because it's a double it's a double warhead, so it's designed first of all to to smash into a tank and melt the steel and soften it. And then the penetrator behind it, the shape charge plows through. 
Um, the original ones were working on fiber optic guidance system, uh, tiny fiber optic uh, wire. That, I guess you can call it a wire. It's really plastic that, that, that unreeled as the, the rocket flew to the target and where the operator could sit in the sheltered position and aim it at the target. Or if the target changed, he could change the target. And if that didn't work, he could drive it into the ground. I mean, you could do a lot of things, but it also gave them a very interesting possibility because it had a TV sensor. So all of a sudden you're seeing the battlefield up close. So you now have uh, uh, the ability to, to understand better what's going on because as this thing flies, you know, it happens very fast, but as it's flying in, you have a great uh, understanding and you can launch other missiles to take care of problems you may not have first perceived. So it's very clever. Today, it's, there are many different models of Spike now. And it's become, I think, probably the world's most, uh, in the Western world, the, the most popular anti-tank weapon uh, there is. I think it's absolutely top seller. But it's also been used in air operations as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's, there's a very funny story behind that. The, the Obama administration um, said the Israelis could no longer have uh, Hellfire missiles for their helicopters. And they were using them against the Hamas terrorists. And Hellfire is a precision missile. So it wasn't like they were blowing up you know, the world. They were trying to kill terrorists, specific terrorists without collateral damage. But that didn't bother Obama uh, or any of the people who work for him. So they just cut off Israel. So, oh, done. No more deliveries. So Israel then took the spike and adopted it, adapted it, I should say, for helicopter use. Well, it turned out it was a bang up success. For the same reason it was a bang up success as an anti-tank weapon. You know, it really worked very well. It's very high precision. Um, you can change targets if you need to, or you can kill it, or you can send it off, you know, far away where it won't bother anybody. So there are lots of reasons for it to be far superior to Hellfire. Once you launch it, it's that's it. It's it's fire and forget, which is why we killed all those people in in uh, Afghanistan. That family that was blown up. Uh, because by the time they realized that their intelligence was, as they say in the vernacular, shit, uh, it was too late. They couldn't change it. Uh, well, that's not true of, of the uh, spike. So, so in any case, uh, the, the bottom line is that spike has turned out to be very popular as a helicopter-based system and is selling very well in Europe and elsewhere. But you know, taking away sales from Lockheed and with its uh, with its a uh, uh, hellfire. So <laughs> the lesson is that if you let people like Obama make stupid decisions, you pay the price. That's how I see it. Or it says how adaptive the Israelis are in terms of understanding threats. That too, I agree. I think that's correct. Speaking about uh, systems to protect tanks, one of those was the trophy system, yes. which emerged, I guess it was on the verge of being initiated in the 2006 war, but it really came following. Yes. The yeah. war. And and two, guess, Israel has two systems like that, trophy being one, and I forgot the name of the other one, but there are two. The US Army has adapted that. They bought, I think, 100 units for the M1 tanks. They do. But that's not very many. No. Uh, because they're hoping, they were hoping to uh, have some U.S. company make a, a competitor. Unfortunately, so far, they haven't done that. Um, and uh, they were very late to the game, actually, because they should have bought them a lot sooner. Because we had guys, you know, sitting in uh, tanks and armored personnel carriers and Hummers and other things in, in Iraq and, and Syria, and Afghanistan, which could have been protected. Um, now they're starting to buy a trophy in, in uh, Europe. I think the Germans have, have bought it. 
have, yeah. So that's good. The, as far as I know, the only other country that has uh, such a system is the Russians. Uh, they claim it works. I mean, it's not it's not been battle proven as far as I know, but they claim it works. It's a similar concept. And it, the, the way they, the Russian approach is very close to the Israeli one. In terms of it detects and then it, it fires at the right moment to intercept a mortar shell or a rocket, whatever is coming, you know, coming at you. So there's, the Israelis are introducing a, a new series of combat vehicles with AI um, target detection, as I understand it. Well, they have a demo called the Challenger. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that th this can be an autonomous vehicle. That is to really? say, you, you can, well, it isn't yet, but I think it, it can be, which means you could drive it into a, a nest of terrorists and take them out without having to risk your own guys. So it has, you know, the robots and you know, robotics, uh, autonomous vehicles is something that's developing very quickly. A lot of that's developments in Israel. Well, uh, it puts the Israelis on the front line of development of that stuff because they've got the war between the wars. Yeah, just think you can put a gun on your Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I think that the idea of land-based robotics as compared to, you know, sea-based or air-based is, you know, all part of the, the idea of autonomous capability. I don't like purely autonomous because there has to be a man in the loop. And if you don't have a man in the loop, uh, all kinds of bad things can happen. So you have to have a man in the loop, but the man doesn't have to sit in the vehicle. You could be behind the lines, quite frankly. Yeah, well, I think you're going to see this with tanks, battle tanks. Uh, I think you're going to see battle tanks that, uh, that are, first of all, can be a lot smaller because they don't have to house people. And they can, you know, load in a, with automatic loaders, which they have anyway already, and and just go out there and, and knock off the enemy. Well, with that remark, we're going to knock off this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank you for your valued time. Sure. And for your insights. And uh, we hope to do this again in the not too distant future. I agree. Let's try so. Let's try to do that. Yep. Uh, pleasure okay. to be with you, Jerry. Always a pleasure. Give our best to your charming wife, Shoshana. I shall. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.